Hey, welcome to ACF Church, and we're so glad that you're with us watching this message online. And our hope is that it would encourage you to be more like Jesus and walk closely with Him as an apprentice of Christ. And our hope is to give away all of these resources for free as much as possible. It takes a lot of time and energy and people to make that happen. And if you'd like to support the mission of God financially for ACF Church, you can go to acfak.org and you can give there. Now enjoy the Word of God proclaimed. Okay, I think that's everything for our picnic. Let's do a double check. Bunch meat? Check. Uh, mustard? Check. Bread? I could have swore I put it somewhere. Oh, there it is. All right, I think we're ready to go. this spot? Yeah. All right, let's do it. They thought they were alone. But they were wrong. What is that? Oh, uh, it's probably nothing. Let's make a sandwich. That was definitely something. There's only one man who could save them. Open up, please! Open up! I've seen it before. It hunts like a wolf. It runs like a man. It's got fear from a mile away. There's no escaping it. But there's gotta be a way. It's here. You guys are in your D's. Well, what's that one? That's mine. See something. Don't miss. Hunted. Ah! Come on, give it up for our creative team. That's awesome. Thank you guys. It's so good. Uh, I go on vacation for a month, and this is what happens. I'm telling you what. Hey, if you're new to ACF Church, uh, yeah, man, we're so glad that you're with us today. We are starting a brand new series talking about spiritual warfare, the spiritual journey that we're on, and that that there is a battle that exists. And we're having a little fun this morning. And um, I'll tell you, let me just tell you guys, I'll start with this, just getting real with you. We've had so many struggles this week with just like technical issues and problems with our equipment. The devil literally lives in the technology. We believe that. So uh, just so many challenges, and our team is really continue to push forward. But what has become more evident than I think ever is that uh, we do have an enemy. And that enemy actually uh, doesn't want us to have this conversation today, doesn't want us to be aware of the deeper spiritual battle that does exist. And so um, if if anything, he wants you to be distracted today. He wants you stuck in your head, maybe thinking about what's going on after church or, you know, what you got planned for lunch, but not to focus right now on, on just shining the light on the reality that there is a demonic power power that exists in this world. And so uh, we just felt like coming into this fall and this season, we wanted to, to, to be honest about this conversation and just bring it into uh, Sunday morning and, and spend a few weeks talking about the spiritual battle that really does exist. And so we've called this series Hunted. Hunted. And, and, and really the idea is that there is a hunter and that we are the hunted. And understanding that reality, I think, is going to really change our lives. And so I'll start with this. So uh, I, I try to be like a decent human being. Anybody else here? You try to have friends and people like you, and you try to be a decent person. And, and I struggle when people have a problem with me, and I don't think they should. Um, I, I just feel like I should be able to work out anything that's wrong in any relationship. And, and, and I don't like it when people don't like me, which is uh, I'm in the wrong world as a pastor, because people are just not going to like you as a pastor sometimes. And that's okay. But I got off the stage, this was a while back, and walked into the lobby, and this guy came up to me, and, and uh, he had this like scowl on his face. He was clearly not coming to tell me how great my sermon was. And he came up to me, and he goes, hey, I want to talk to you. And I was like, what's going on? And he goes, you know, I have hated you for a really long time. 
I'm like, that's a great way to start off. And, and, uh, and I said, well, let's start with your name. And because I didn't know this guy from Adam. And so he, he explained to me that he grew up in a, in a church that was really dysfunctional, really unhealthy. Like some of you this morning have a, a story of church hurt or Christians that did things that um, you didn't think they should do. You weren't loved by God's people. You were judged by God's people. And he had this pastor that had treated him, uh, I think, poorly. And he said, you know what? You look just like him. Have you ever run into somebody like that, that they resemble somebody that you hate? And, uh, and like when you see them, you're like, I already don't like you. You might be the best person in the world. You might be you know, potentially my best friend, but I don't like you because you look like him or because you look like her. And the reason I want to start off with that is because we do live in a spiritual battle. And the reality is, as Christians, the, the goal is that we resemble Christ, right? And so here's what you need to know. If you're a follower of Jesus today, the more you re- resemble Jesus, the more battle you will experience. The more you look like Jesus, the more you look like who the the enemy or the hunter hates, which means the more opposition you will experience in life. And and this night might not be how you were talked to about Christianity uh, growing up or or maybe uh, just not the the conversation you've heard before that that when you choose to follow Jesus, it, it actually gets difficult and that there are some challenges and that the more you look like Jesus, the more opposition will come to you. And, and we need to be thinking about that, especially as a church, that we see people give their hearts to Jesus on a weekly basis. Um, in fact, last week we saw 11 people get baptized, which is just amazing. Yeah, we can celebrate that. But I want you thinking, as you see somebody get baptized, I know you're, maybe if you're a believer, you're like, man, that's so cool, and that reminds me of my baptism. But would you pray for them? Would you just pray? Because that is such a major step to get in front of a bunch of people and say, I am a follower of Jesus. I'm not going to be ashamed of my Savior. And then I guarantee it, maybe some of you here were, were some of those, those 11, that there's opposition that you feel. Maybe as soon as you leave these doors, it begins. And the struggle continues. And so I want to start with this reality. You can write this down. Is that you have an enemy, whether you admit it or not. If you showed up here and you're like, man, I'm, I'm a man of my own life. I control my own destiny. Well, the reality is you're not as in control as you think you are. And you have an enemy that's actually working to keep you from the good things that God has planned for you. Now, the problem is we are constantly diverted from understanding that there is a spiritual battle, constantly distracted. And we don't often recognize that this exists. And so the world that we live in is, is as uh, Stuart mentioned earlier, a disunified world. A world where we can, we can fight about anything. We can turn any topic into a weapon in 2021, can't we? And so I want to read this passage. This is going to be kind of a, a root passage for the whole series. And it's Ephesians 6, 12. It says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, I mean, if you don't get anything else out of the message today, would you just embrace that reality that the struggle you have today is not with the person sitting next to you? The struggle is not against the politician or the the, the school board member or the boss at work. The struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities. You see, we actually believe that we have an enemy that is holding the world captive to these lies has deceived the world to believe things that are not true. And so what often happens is instead of fighting the captor, we fight the captives. We fight those who are being held captive by things that are not true instead of understanding we do have an enemy. So I've entitled today's message, Know the Hunter. Know the Hunter. Any hunters in the room want to identify yourselves? Yeah, lots of hunters in Alaska. I'm hearing a lot of hunting stories this time of year. Uh, Coming into September and October, this is hunting season. And so... I'm a hunter. I get out and do this a lot. And one of the ways that I prepare for hunting season every year is I watch a lot of YouTube. I don't know if you guys prepare this way or not, but I watch a lot of YouTube and I want to, I want to watch these hunting shows and watch other people pursue the game. And, and the whole idea is I want to understand the animal that I'm pursuing. Does that make sense? Right? Like I want to learn how to use their hunger, their desires, their impulses, their anger, their curiosity, even their sexuality to lure them in. And the thing that you need to know today is that we have a hunter, which means that you are the hunted. And, and as the hunted, the hunter has been watching you. 
I mean, since the day you were born has been studying your life. Kind of creepy. I get it. But like you have been watched since the day you were born. And so the, the truth is this. This is an important conversation because we need to get to know the hunter as well as the hunter has gotten to know us. We need to understand his tactics, start to see him for what he is. And, and it may not be what you think. In fact, most times it's not because he is not always an overt threat. In many ways, he's a covert threat. In many ways, he does things in ways that you don't expect. And so you might be here today and you're like, well, I'm not being attacked by any you know, demonic force or any enemy. And my life's pretty good. And I got some money in my savings account and I'm feeling pretty healthy right now. But the enemy works in subtle ways. Sometimes through making your life so comfortable that he can lull you to sleep and cause you to be distracted by your comfort so that you don't notice the things of God happening in the world. To kind of insulate you from what God is doing and from the challenges that other people are experiencing. It's happening in ways that I think many times we don't even realize. And so what we want to do throughout the series is kind of pull apart this issue and come back to what is true. We want to go to the Word of God to identify for us what does the demonic look like in the world around us? Especially as we come into Halloween in this season where, you know, you're watching all the old slasher movies or, you know, there's the, like, Jason marathon that happens, like Jason 20. I don't know how many there are. There's gonna be a, all those movies are going to happen. Netflix is going to be covered with these type of shows. We need to be able to separate what's true from what's false. The truth from a lie. And that's, that's why we go to the Word of God. And so, where did evil begin? Where did it all start? Well, if, if you're a Christian, you might know the, the story begins in Genesis with Adam and Eve. God creates man and woman, places them in this garden that, that, that is this perfect environment for them to thrive and exist in beautiful peace and harmony with one another and with God. And so that's what the world was. It was peaceful. There was unity, harmony. They're just filled with love for each other, filled with love for God. And then as the story continues, we're introduced to a serpent. And, and maybe you, you remember this if you've read this story before, but this serpent is Satan himself. And he comes to tempt Adam and Eve to deceive them, right? And we read later that this serpent was actually a fallen angel. He was one of the most beautiful angels who at some point decided that he didn't want to worship God. He wanted to be God. And so this Satan was cast uh, from heaven. This, this uh, demonic being was cast from heaven. And we know him as Satan. And interestingly enough, that reality, I don't want to worship God, I want to be God, lies at the root of most of what's evil in the world today. I can tell you most of my bad decisions have, have come from this feeling like, I don't want to worship God, I want to be God. I want to make my own choice right now. And so this continues to be perpetuated in the world around us. He is the root of all that is evil in the world. And now the world is marked not by harmony and peace and unity, but by disunity, by, by disintegration, by, by pain and suffering and death in the world around us. So next question is, what do we call this being? Like, what do we, what do we name? We, we've used the word Satan, right? The Bible calls him the evil one. The Bible calls him the tempter. The Bible calls him the liar, but we often call him Satan. And interestingly enough, Satan is not like his name. This is kind of little known fact. It's not like Bill, George, William, Satan. Um, in the Greek text, it's actually the Satan. So you can, you can now, now from now on, you're like, the Satan is tempting me. But that's literally what the text says is the Satan, which literally means the adversary. So you have an adversary. Once again, I know you want to be liked. I know you want people to, to, to like you, but, but you also have an adversary that wants to, to steal and kill and destroy. In fact, from uh, one commentator, he wrote this about the names we give him. Another name is devil, right? Now, devil, diabolos, which is where we get the word diabolical. Devil in secular Greek means backbiter or an accuser. So if you walked in here with some accusations, maybe when you walked into church today, you immediately started hearing you don't deserve to be in this room. You don't have it figured out. You don't belong with these people. They don't want you here, and you have better things to do. Like maybe it's even happening right now. He's accusing you of things. He says, i.e. an accuser, calumnator, or slanderer, slanderer, diabolos, is literally someone who casts through, i.e. making charges that bring down or destroy. 
Satan is used by God in this plan as a predictable wind-up toy playing out his evil nature. And I love his comment on that, that, that God actually uses Satan. He's being used in the world to fulfill God's ultimate plans. So that's Satan. Now, what about demons? We believe demons exist. And demons are actually other heavenly beings that also rebelled against God who assist Satan in tearing down what God has created, in tearing apart what God wants to unify. So we have demons, we have Satan that both exist. Now, at this point, some of you are already checked out because you're like, it just got weird at church today. Like, I don't know. I just wanted to hear some Bible, hear some stuff about you. Like, this is getting strange. And I get that everybody walks in here with your own perceptions of this stuff. Um, and, and I'll confess for me, I don't often live like this is real. I, I can open the Bible and, and say that it's real and say, okay, I can make an argument for it. But if you looked at my life, I bet you would see, man, Brian needs to grow in his awareness of the reality of the spiritual battle that's happening around him. And part of the problem, I think, is that we have all of these different caricatures in our heads when we think of devil, we think of demons. Like for you, I want you to think about it. When I hear Brian say Satan or devil, what comes to mind? Maybe for you, uh, this comes to mind. (laughs) Who's this? Anybody? Charlie Charlie Daniels. What's the song? Yeah, devil went down to Georgia looking for a soul, soul to steal. I love that one. So maybe a little, little fiddle comes to mind when you think of devil. Uh, some of you South Park fans, uh, you think of this. This comes to mind when you hear the word devil. Uh, some of you think of this type of a scenario, right? So you've got these, this angelic being, this demonic being, devil, good against evil, Yin against yang, this kind of epic, never-ending cosmic battle between good and evil. Maybe that's what you think of when you think of devil. Some of you are watching this show because you're on Netflix, right? This one just came out. Again, not promoting everything on the screen here. I'm just saying this is what you're and many people think of when you think of devil. How about this one? Remember the shoe debacle? Little Nas and the devil shoes? Remember this whole thing? He, he, like a drop of blood used in every shoe, just kind of creepy. But this was a real big deal, and the Christians really got angry because of this whole thing, and, and, and rightfully so. Maybe you're a sports fan, so you think of the Blue Devils when you think of the devil. But everybody has a caricature that pops into your mind when you think of the devil. And, and I just want you to know, this is a perfect scenario for the hunter. Again, just to kind of clarify, when I say the hunter, I mean the devil himself. Like the best case scenario is that we could turn something that is real into a joke. That we could not acknowledge that there's actually a demonic battle and a demonic uh, presence in the world around us. And that every time we think of things like this, it makes us think of cartoons, TV shows, uh, you know, controversies happening publicly. And, And so it keeps us from actually taking this seriously and considering these things for what they are. And some of us get really superstitious. You know, you freak out about 666, right? And so it makes you, everywhere you go, you're, you're at Costco and you check out at Costco and the cost is $666. So you buy a pack of gum, right? Because you're like, it can't be that. I don't, I don't want to go home with that on my receipt, you know, I'll get a car wreck or something. So we become really superstitious and it just gets really strange, which is why we have to come back to what does God say? What does the Bible say about good and evil in this world. I'd say that probably most of us in the room fall into one camp or another. There are two ditches when it comes to the spiritual battle around us. The first ditch is that you're obsessed with it. Something you talk about, think about all the time. And the second ditch is that you are oblivious to it. So some of us in the room are like, man, yeah, Brian, I I think about this stuff a lot. Um, I probably watch too many scary movies. Um, I'm probably kind of worried about it. Like, You know, when I'm out at night, I get scared that there's like a demon under every bush. And then others of you are like, this is just strange. I don't think about it at all. I would say if you're obsessed, you're probably fearful. That's what tends to happen. When you become obsessed with demonic things, when your mind is fixated on what's evil in the world, it starts to be all you see. And in fact, in Romans 8, if you want to open up to that in your Bible, Romans 8 verse 5 Paul's going to talk about both kinds of people, people who are fixated on what's happening in the world and the evil that's in the world and those who are fixated on God and kind of what happens in their lives. He says this in verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set 
on what the flesh desires. So again, there's a way to live according to, to just what's physical, what's in, in the flesh, in the world. And your minds are, are fixated on those things. It's what you obsess about. He goes on, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So we have two options. We can either live consumed by death or consumed by life and peace. We all have a decision to make, and it comes back to what is it that you are letting your mind be controlled by? This is why the Bible says, take your thoughts captive. You have to control your thoughts because where your mind tends to go is what has power in your life and ends up, I think, controlling you. And so if you're, if you're here today, and I just want to say, if you have been overcome by accusations, even today, or fear, or, or, or evil in your own life, this is what Paul says to respond to it in verse 31. He says, what then shall we say in response to these things? And I love this statement. Don't miss this. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? Come on, you guys. Like, that's a big deal. Because I know you all have accusations in your minds. There's things that have been said about you, either by people that are ringing in your head, who God used that person to, to hurt you, or, or by the enemy, the hunter himself, And I love this statement, who can bring a charge against you because you were chosen by God? God says, you are my son. You are my daughter. And ultimately, in this world, in in, in the entire universe, the authority that has all authority is God himself. So maybe that's you today. Maybe you tend to be in fear. Um, You're kind of obsessed with this. Maybe you're here today. I'd say most people in the room tend to live oblivious. Like, we don't really pay any attention to the demonic battle that exists around us. Like, for some reason, you can believe in Jesus. You can believe in his resurrection from the dead. But this idea of demons, like, that's a little too out there for you, which is funny. Like, I think resurrection's pretty out there. Um, You know, Jesus, God in the flesh, come to the world to take away our sins. That's that's kind of out there. It's true, but it's out there. As well as demonic powers are kind of out there as well. Maybe you remember this quote from the movie, The Usual Suspects. I love this. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. And I don't think this is just true outside of the church. I think it's just as true in the church. Maybe this is part of why so many uh, Christians are struggling right now because as we look at the world around us, we think it's just people that are tearing each other apart. We don't acknowledge that there is a demonic force in the world everywhere we look. So whether you're obsessed or oblivious, how do we move forward? What do we do with this reality that there is a demonic force in the world around us? And how do we even take a step forward? Because sometimes, can we admit, that force seems pretty strong. Can we admit sometimes it looks like God didn't win, but Satan won? Uh, Sometimes things look really broken. There's a lot of death. There's a lot of loss. Well, here's the truth, is that the hunter has a limited impact on the physical and the spiritual. Amen to that, right? There's a limited impact. He is limited in every way. Sometimes what people tend to do is give Satan the attributes of God. Back to that image of the demon and the angel kind of being equal forces. God and Satan are not equal in any way. They're not equal in any way. This is not an epic, never-ending cosmic battle. The truth is, Jesus, when he was resurrected from the dead, he conquered sin and death. He won the war, but the battle still rages. And it will rage until the day that Jesus returns to establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And so we as Christians, we're pushing toward that day and believing for that day and living in faithfulness toward that day. So don't ascribe the attributes of God to Satan. Like, like, well, who's God? God is omnipresent, right? He's everywhere at one time. He's, He's all over. Satan is not. Okay? God is all knowing. Satan is not. God has all power. Power. Satan does not. We can argue biblically that God knows your thoughts. I can't argue biblically that Satan knows your thoughts. I think he can tempt us. 
I think he can put us in situations that he knows have often led to us failing and and can kind of orchestrate our circumstances. I think he might even be able to speak to us. I don't know for sure. I know I've, I've heard some things before in my mind where I'm like, I don't think that was God and I don't think that was me. Then who was it? And so be very careful about thinking that Satan is like God. He's not. His power is limited. Kind of a, a, maybe a, a way to imagine this. So uh, I, I remember when I was a kid, I was walking down the street and I was walking by all these different houses and, and uh, this one house, they had a, a little beagle, a little dog sitting out front in the yard. And I love dogs. And so I, I was like, I was going to go pet this dog. And like, like every kid, my parents told me, never pet somebody else's dog that you don't know, but you know, who listens to their parents. And so I was like, I'm going to go pet this dog. And so I go walk into the yard and I'm like, hey, puppy, hey, little guy. And he kind of looked a little weird and he was just staring straight away from me like he was ignoring me and he was like frozen. And then like in, a, in the drop of a, of a hat, he just turned at me and launched right at me full force, was, was running and he's going to rip my face off. I mean, full on drooling and barking and angry. And he got like right here and then boink, got yanked right back the other direction because he had a chain around his neck. And I'm like, served you right, right? And walked off, and I was like, never, never am I going to do that again. But I just remember thinking, man, I'm so glad that dog was on a chain. It was limited. And I think a good way to think of the devil is like he's like a dog on a chain. He's limited. Does he have an impact on the world? Absolutely. But he's been defeated. And he only has so much chain. God is the one with the control of the chain. Only so much gets let out at any time. I love Colossians 2 because it speaks about the struggle that we have with sin, that we do see the enemy at work in our lives and, and, and all of us have a story of being defeated at certain points and making decisions that we're not proud of and living according to the flesh. But here's what he says in Colossians 2. He says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, simply saying living like you're not separated from the world, but living in the world. He says, God made you alive with Christ. That's so good. When you were dead, God made you alive. You didn't make yourself alive. You didn't beat the enemy because you're so strong. You didn't overcome your sin because you're so committed. No, God took a dead person and made that a living person. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And I love this part. And having disarmed the powers and authorities... He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So your redemption is a testimony to the limited nature of the demonic forces in the world. Like the the story that you have of, man, like I've got some mistakes, but yet Jesus has taken me and made me alive. It it actually shows and displays that reality that, that the enemy, the hunter, is limited. You see, the limited nature of the demonic only serves to highlight the supremacy of Christ in a dark and broken world. Some of you maybe have wondered, well, why does evil even exist? Like, some of you have asked God, God, just take evil away from the world. Why is this something that exists? But what it shows you is what the world looks like apart from the grace of God. Like, without evil, I think most of us wouldn't be able to understand or even begin to comprehend how good God is. And I think about this sometimes, like, what would my life look like if for just a moment God removed his grace from my life? I mean, what would you look like? What would your family look like? The Bible calls uh, what's being laid upon the world this common grace. It's this idea that the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. And so we see this reality that, that God pours grace out on the entire world, even the broken parts. And what would it look like if for a moment God removed that hand of grace. And I just know at some point, at some point, there is going to be a release of evil in this world, and God will come. He will finally, for the last time, defeat the devil, and and everything will be made right. But on this side of heaven, on this side of eternity for us, it's going to be pretty broken. It's going to be pretty messy. If you look at the book of Job, if you've ever read um, that story, uh, it's really a, it's a parable about this guy that has everything taken from him. In fact, the, the name Job is like a, it's like a metaphor for somebody who just, everything's going wrong in their life. It's like, man, you're like living the life of Job. If you don't know much about the story, Job was a guy that was living a good life. 
He was living a righteous life. He was, he was influencing his community well. He was, he was honorable. And so Satan comes to God and says he wants to afflict someone. And God goes, consider my servant Job, which I'm like, I don't want that job, right? I mean, sure, God changed my life, but I don't want to I don't want that job. Consider my servant Brian. But he says, consider my servant Job. And, and then as you read the story, you continue to see how the enemy starts taking things from Job. It's an example, I think, for you if you're wondering, like, what does the influence of demonic forces look like in my life, in the world around me? You can look at the life of Job. Because this is what the enemy began to do as God let out a little bit of leash for the hunter if you look at his life, here's what he experienced. Death. Some of you experienced some death in the family recently. Uh, sickness. We've seen sickness run rampant the past couple of years, haven't we? Loneliness. Some of you walked in here very lonely. Financial loss. You've experienced that lately. Loss of his home. Family turmoil. All of these things, we tend to go, man... Life's just not going well right now. Things are just not going the way I had planned. Like, it's just kind of difficult right now. But what if behind the things that are broken in your life is actually a demonic power? If you read the Bible and you believe it, you need to acknowledge that that's the truth. That behind all those things, the, the, the decisions you've made, you're going, man, my kids are just nuts right now. I'm a terrible parent. Well, maybe you are. We've all made terrible parent decisions. You're like, I'm glad I came to church today. Maybe you are. Maybe we are all bad parents sometimes. But here's the deal. Behind my terrible parenting is also a demonic force that wants to steal and kill and destroy my family. So, so there, is a, there, there are decisions that we own. And Book of James talks about that. James says, hey, you are lured and enticed by your own desires. So we can't just be like, oh, man, I made a bad choice. The devil made me do it, Right? We can't just always blame the devil, but what we can say is that behind that decision are influences and forces that want to destroy your life. And they want to steal from you, and they want to take from you. So we want to acknowledge that reality, and, and, and that the world is pretty messed up. There's a lot of evil in the world around us, and, and here's, here's why. Because the world has a ruler, and it's not God. The reason the world looks like it's overcome by demonic powers is because it is. God has let the leash out for now for him to, to roam to a certain degree. In fact, 1 John 5, 19 says, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So know this, once again, God has overarching authority. God is the one holding the leash, right? God controls what the, the devil can and cannot do in your life and in mine. But in this world, God, for right now, has allowed him to have power on earth. And we see it every single day. We would be fools not to acknowledge it or to act like and live like it doesn't exist. So it exists in the world. Well, here's the reality, though. It doesn't just exist out there. It also exists in here, in the church. There's demonic power influencing people in the church. In fact, Jesus shows up and he's dealing with these religious leaders who are literally being used by the devil, uh, who should have been leading people into freedom, but was, they were leading people into slavery, should have been leading people into grace and peace and life, but they're leading them into law and condemnation. And here's how he responds to the religious leaders. He says this, you belong to your father, the devil. Now, if Jesus ever talks to you like that, it's time to get on your knees, right? Like nobody ever wants to have Jesus be like, your dad's the devil, by the way. And then he goes on. He says, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So if you look at lies and deception in the world, you can look behind it and see Satan. That's what he's literally he's saying. All Satan does all the time in every way is lie. He lies. He deceives and so I don't, I don't want to get too much into how he works. We're going to talk about more of that next week. But the reality is at a baseline, who the devil is, is a liar. He's going to deceive you. We, we read earlier, he's going to accuse you and slander you. Slanders, uh, accusing you of things that are not true about you. 
And this is what the enemy does. He wants to tell you that the things that will lead to death will give you life. The things that will steal from you will actually give to you. And here's the worst part. Because we are sinful beings, at some point or another, we have all wanted to believe the lies. There are lies in your life and in mine that I've just embraced wholeheartedly. I said, you know what? That just feels right. When I wear that shame, it just feels right for me. When I wear that accusation, it just feels right. I just put it on like a, like a coat in the morning. Like it just feels right to me. We have all wanted to believe the lies. And like any lie, we have an option every single day. You can either push it away or you can just kind of drink it in. Every lie that comes out, you have a decision every single day when you're confronted with a lie. Push it away or drink that lie in. So I want to do something here today. Would you find your communion cup? Maybe you guys got that when you came in somewhere. If you need one, put your hand up. Our first impressions. Do we have any more of those or we, did we run out? Nope, we have no more. So share with your neighbor. COVID. Yay. Anyway, <laughs> don't share with your neighbor. Anyway, we're going to take communion together. This is uh, for believers in Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus, uh, feel free to just kind of watch and hang out. Um, this is an ancient tradition that believers have done for, for centuries to acknowledge what Jesus ha has done for us. And I want to talk about it for a minute when it comes to lies, because what Jesus is going to do is he's going to kind of reframe some things for us here today. The prophet Jeremiah, he speaks about how God's judgment was on his people because they had rejected God in the ways of God. And it's so interesting, the, the metaphor he uses in Jeremiah chapter 25, he says this, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says to me. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. So this is what God is speaking to the nations as they have lived in the lies, as they have walked away from God and believed the lies. Is like he equates what they've done to like drinking the wine. Now, some of you are wine lovers. You're not going to acknowledge it in church, but you're going to go home today, pour yourself a little wine, right? You like a good glass of of wine. Yes or no? Can you have too much wine? <laughs> yes, you can. So he says, <laughs> yes, you guys are way too emphatic about, yes, <laughs> Friday night. I'm still feeling it. So <laughs> he's equating the wrath of God to a glass of wine. And he's like, hey, all these lies that you've been believing, you're kind of sipping on. He's like, you know what? Just give them away to their desires. Give them away to their lies. Don't just give them a sip of that wine. Make them drink the whole cup. And so he's literally saying like, and they're going to experience the wrath. It represents all of the judgment, the lies, the things that we've, we've walked into. And he's like, hey, just make them drink it all so they will see the truth. And some of you at a very practical level have been there. Where you drank the whole glass of wine. And after that, man, you made some decisions that were really poor. You're stumbling around kind of drunk, right? And this is the imagery that Jeremiah is using. Like, like these people who should be following God instead are choosing the lie. So God's like, just make them drink it all. And they're going to stumble around drinking the wrath of God in, the judgment of God in. But then what's interesting is Jesus shows up and he wants to flip this metaphor on its head completely. In fact, in Luke 22, Jesus is right before he's going to be crucified you remember what he pleads with his father about? He says this, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. What was the cup? It was the wrath of God. All the lies. All that you and I have chosen to walk in. Every deceptive thing that you and I have chosen to believe. Every lie that we have walked in. It's like, Jesus is having an anxiety attack because he's about to drink in every sin that you and I have ever committed on the cross. And he looks at his father and he's like, this is going to be terrible. I don't want to drink that cup. But, he says, but not my will, but yours be done. I will do it because I love them that much. And this is your plan for me, Father. So Jesus, we know he goes to the cross, right? So think about this. Wine is red. It represents blood. And for Israel, for generations, when there was sin, when there was a lie that they had believed, there was a sacrifice. There was always some kind of sacrifice. Blood represented death. 
It represented sin and loss. And what Jesus does in the upper room with his disciples is he wants to completely reframe this whole picture so that now the wine doesn't represent the the wrath of God. It doesn't represent the lies that we drink in, but now it's going to represent the righteousness of Jesus experienced by those who would put their faith in Christ in the power that he uh, poured out on the cross. And so we're going to start off, he talks about his body because his body would be broken. And if you want to peel off that little cracker, we're going to take this together. If you're at home, you can grab a piece of bread from the cupboard or something if you want to take this with us, maybe a little bit of juice. But he's going to talk about how his body would be broken. What a terrible thing. Once again, when you think about communion, it makes no sense that we would celebrate it if you don't understand what it's about. Blood and body broken, that sounds terrible. But Jesus, again, his body was broken for us. So Matthew 26, 26, it says, And when they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. So would you take and eat together? and peel off the cover for the juice there. He wants to talk about his blood being spilled for them and for us. Verse 27, then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Go ahead and drink to that. I want you to think about this for a moment. This idea of blood, something that's glorified, especially coming into Halloween and this season, something the world glorifies, the idea of blood. Blood represented death, but now through Christ, it represents life. What represented brokenness in the broken body of Christ now represents wholeness. As people were under the law, this covenant of the law, now Jesus says you are now under the covenant of grace. I want to give you my life. Now, here's what you need to know. If you just took communion, you didn't just participate in a little ceremony here at church today. I want you to hear me on this. You just declared war against the hunter, against the enemy. Like, it's a big deal. You need to understand that. Like, taking communion is saying, I reject the lies of the enemy, and I stand firm on the truth of Jesus. And so... So acknowledge that as you leave the building here today in a few minutes, that you walk into a battleground. I mean, you're in it right now. You might be feeling it right now. It's a declaration of war. And so if that's a war, if a war does exist, you're going to have to call out the lies every day. Maybe you walked in here today and you're hearing you're guilty, you're unlovable, you're unworthy, you're hopeless. You're a lost cause. You're too far gone. You're broken. You're too cynical. You're too doubtful. You're unaccepted. You're unwanted. I want you to hear me today. None of that is the voice of God in your life. The cross says you are loved and you are set free. So here's what Paul says to every accusation. Maybe you need to write this verse. This is Romans 8, 37. Uh, Maybe you need to write this on the, the mirror at home just to remind you of this scripture or pin it up somewhere where you're going to see it uh, in your car on the way to work. But here's what he says to every accusation and every lie. He says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is so good. And so some of you, like, you just need to read that at a lie in your life. You just need to recite that reality. So this is all true. Now, how do we begin to see the tactics of the enemy? How do we begin to notice him at work in our families and in our homes? How do we begin to resist him so that we can overcome temptation? Well, that'd be a great conversation for next week. So I know, I know. But hey, if you want to grab your card here real quick, um, we do action steps every single week at ACF Church, and this is just a way for us to move forward. Once again, 
What the enemy wants you to do right now is to pat yourself on the, on the back when you leave church for going to church. Like, like you're God's special little man or woman because you showed up here for an hour. You don't have to do anything else for a week. That's what the enemy wants. But what God would want is for you to take a step forward and move forward in faithfulness. And so um, if you want to just tear this little card off, you can drop it in one of the baskets on the way out. We, we promise not to spam you. We're going to text you one encouraging text this week just to remind you of the commitment you made and to say we're praying for you. That's it. So maybe your first step is just to choose to follow Jesus. I just want you to know that's the best decision you'll ever make. I mean, if you're going, man, this demonic stuff is kind of freaky. It's kind of scary. It is. It should be apart from Jesus. But in Jesus, you have nothing to fear. So maybe today you just say, well, I'm going to choose to follow Jesus today. That seems like the, I want to be on that side of the battle. That's where I feel. Maybe you haven't believed in demonic powers, but today you do. I know people who have been in the church their whole life, and they're like, honestly, I have never believed that this stuff is real. Maybe you're taking that step to say, I'm just going to acknowledge that this is the real thing. Maybe you, you're going to call out sin as demonic power in your life. Like you came here today and you're like, I thought I just couldn't get a handle on my porn addiction, but maybe there's something else behind that. Like I thought I'm just a rageaholic with my children and with my friends, and maybe there's something else behind that. I thought I'd just uh, deal with self-harm and hate myself and, and shame, but maybe there's something else behind that. I just want you to consider that there is. And maybe the last one for you, you would say, I'm going to trade fear of the demonic for faith in the power of Jesus today. If you walked in here t today kind of obsessed and scared of this stuff, I just want you to know in Jesus, once again, you have nothing to fear. And maybe you just stand on that truth here with us here today. Would you stand up? I want to pray, and we'll close in worship. God, thank you for ACF Church. Thank you for the people here today, God, who have come out to hear your word preached and who have stepped into a battle. And God, we want to acknowledge together that uh, the battle is raging around us and we often live pretty oblivious to it. God, would you protect ACF? Would you protect the other churches in this community, God? We have an enemy that wants to divide us, that wants to distract us, that wants us either to get really comfortable or to become overwhelmed by the opposition. And so God, I pray that we begin just in small ways, even today, to see the tactics of the enemy at work in our lives. Father, would you, would you watch over us this week? And God, I pray that the commitments that we make this morning would, would flow over into Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. God, we want to do so much more than just show up to church for, for a little bit. We actually want to live transformed lives. And we believe by the power of your spirit that that can happen. God, that you can break people free today from things that they have struggled with for their entire life. You are an addiction-breaking God. You're a freedom-giving God. You are a shame-destroying God. So set us free, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thanks for watching this message from ACF Church. Uh, we hope it's encouraged you and challenged you to be more like Jesus and to walk with Him in a closer and more profound way. If you'd like to give to the mission of ACF Church, you can do so at the link on the screen or at acfak.org. We love you and we'll see you next week.